we're going to look at something we've been uh, thinking about called finding life in the desert. And I'm not sure if you've ever spent much time in the desert. Uh, this is Florida. And I don't see too much desert here. But in California, we do have deserts, Mojave Desert. And, and I, used to, I used to love go, uh, to go dirt biking in the desert. The desert to me was a place of relaxation and rest. Um, but most of the time, people don't like going to the desert. It's hot and there's not that much water there, and it's tiring, and you get hungry. But there's something about the desert that God uh, uses to teach and to train. In fact, if you were to do a study on biblical characters, almost every man or woman that God uses, he takes them through a desert period. Moses, Elijah, David, even Esther, you could say, went through a desert moment. And this morning, I want to look at the life of Jesus because his life is worth looking into and his time in the desert. What happened to him when he found himself in the wilderness and uh, otherwise known as the temptation of Jesus Christ? And we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at the source of temptation, the sequence of temptation, and then the solution of temptation. So again, open your Bibles, Matthew chapter 4. I'm reading out of the uh, ESV version here today, uh, but we should have a good time. Let's see. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, which I love that the Scripture is so just blunt. Jesus was hungry. That's right. And the tempter came and said to him, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you, if you will fall down and worship me. Well, then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Well, this is God's word for us this morning. Would you join me as we pray over our time together? Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to come into the house of God today. For I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Father, I recognize that these here this morning, they really could be anywhere today, anywhere. But God, you have brought them here to this place, to this church, to these seats. And I believe it's not by accident, but by your divine providence that they are here this morning. There are some here that need a word of encouragement from you. Oh, Father, I pray you would give. There's some here this morning that need a sense of direction to turn left, to turn right, to go straight. Oh, Lord, I pray you would lead them today. And there's some here that maybe are just weary and worn down, overwhelmed and overcome. Oh, I pray Jesus today you would just fill them up with joy today. Oh, pump them up with your Holy Spirit today. Lord, not my word, but your word spoken in this place this morning. Here we are. We are your children listening to you, expecting great things from you this morning. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Exciting. Turning temptation into triumph. Um, and again, we'll just look at a couple things, the source of temptation, the sequence of temptation, and of course, we'll end with the solution. Because here's what we know. Without opposition, there can be no victory. Without struggle, we would never know our strength, right? When you go to a gym, you go in there, there's a lot of weight equipment. There are heavy weights because you want to work out. You want to know, how can I lift this? It's a struggle in lifting weights. You don't go there, there's a bunch of like down comforters and feathers, right? There's heavy stuff to do. You got to do hard things. It's with uh, the struggle we find our strength. And our Heavenly Father knows this, which is why I believe he's not removed opposition from our life. It's why he allows it. 
It's so why he allows it to enter into our life, because there's something to be gained in the struggle, in the opposition, in the um, temptation, if you will. But more often than not, I find myself or Christians that I come in contact with walking around defeated as opposed to walking around in victory. So when I started thinking about this idea of finding life in the desert, what can we look at the life of Jesus while he was in the desert, while it was a hard time going through, what can we learn from his life? And we can actually see triumph out of temptation. When I think about this last year, you know, today marks uh, one year of uh, COVID uh, happening, kind of the pandemic hitting our nation. It was one year ago today, this Sunday, that we had to go online throughout the nation as churches. One year ago today, what the schools were closed. You know, one year ago today, that everything changed. And we can look at 2020 as, in, a, in essence, as a, as a desert. What, were, what was going on last year? What struggles did we kind of have to go through? And as we look at this year, one year later, 2021, what does the Lord want from, what can we learn from that? How can we grow? How can we overcome? So we're going to see that this morning. Because we know that we can never outgrow temptation, but we can overcome it. So let's look at this first idea of the source of temptation. Look at verse 1, Matthew verse 4. We read this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now watch the text here. See what it says. It says, he says that he was led up by the Spirit. That word there in the Greek, led, means to put out to sea, to set sail, to be driven by the wind. But yet we read in verse 1 that he was driven by the wind, led by the Spirit. His Spirit set sail to what? To be tempted by the devil. So the Spirit is leading him, but the devil is tempting. So what's going on? Like, what's the situation here? Well, let's spend a moment and think about the definition of temptation. I know a lot of you are Bible students, and this is maybe not new to you, but as a way of reminder, temptation is an enticement or an invitation to act contrary to God's will. Temptation is an enticement or an invitation to act contrary to God's will. Uh, I, I kind of think about fishing. Are there any fishermen in the house, fisherwomen in the house this, this morning? A couple people fishing, yeah. I actually was born in Texas and spent a lot of time uh, fishing in lakes. Uh, I have a great aunt who has a house in Missouri, Went, spent lots of summers on Table Rock Lake fishing. And thinking about fishing, it's really fun, uh, unless you don't catch stuff, which is not that much fun. But when you call it catching, that's more exciting. But when you think about fishing, right, you have the, if you don't use a lure, you just have a hook and some, you know, earthworms. That's how I used to just do it. And the thing about an earthworm, their fish wants to eat the worm. That's the temptation part. But the hook is there to catch the, the, the fish. And we think about temptation. That's what it's like. The temptation is like the worm trying to attract you to, to do, act contrary to God's will. We think about the book of James. James talks about it like this. Hey, you have a desire, this temptation. Desire leads to deception. Deception leads to disobedience. And disobedience leads to death. Now, the temptation itself is not sin, right? The little fishy and little worm, the worm is not sin, but the hook is what gets you. So the temptation itself is not sin, but temptation leads us to sin. And as a way of reminder, sin is anything that we say, think, or do that displeases God. And sin's advertised price is always lower than the actual cost, right? I mean, sin always promises life, but it only delivers death. Sin always takes you farther than you wanted to go. It keeps you longer than you wanted to stay. And it costs you more than you were willing to pay. Now, the difference, though, is that temptation and testing, there's a difference. The Spirit was leading Jesus, but it was the devil that was tempting him. So let's think about this, right? God allows trials and struggles to enter into our life because he wants to see us stand. But the devil, Satan, tempts us because he wants to see us stumble, right? God tests to develop, but Satan tempts to destroy. God will test to build us. Satan will tempt us to break us. God will test us to see the best come out of us, but Satan will tempt us to see the worst. And the same bait can be used for both. What God would send as a trial to grow and to strengthen, Satan would want to use to tempt and to see us weaken. And this is what we see here in the wilderness. Look at the sequence of events. Again, verse 1. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Now, if you'd like to write in your Bible, circle that word, then. Then Jesus. The sequence is important here. What happened before the wilderness experience? Anybody know? Shout out. I'm a hollerback preacher. The baptism, right? The baptism. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. I'll read a few verses to you. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. Now, John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered and said, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. So then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. Look look at this scene. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Notice the sequence. Jesus went from the water to the wilderness. From the water to the wilderness. Listen, there's, this was not an isolated and independent events. One moment Jesus is in community. The next he's in isolation. One minute he's being baptized. The next he's in the battlefield. One moment he's hearing a voice from heaven. The next moment he's hearing a voice from hell. Water to the wilderness. Friends, can we not identify with that? Do we not know what it's like to go from the water to the wilderness? Sunday morning, here we are. Just, the worship team was on point today, leading us to Jesus. We're just like, yes, Jesus, cornerstone, woo! And then Monday morning hits, boom. It's like, oh, the wilderness, temptation. Where was that joy? Where is that community? I'm all by myself. I'm overwhelmed by fear and, and anxiousness and worry. And oh, man, from the water to the wilderness. We understand what it happens. Listen, we can never see the approval of heaven that's going to keep us from the attacks from, from the enemy, right? Approval from heaven does not keep us from the attacks from the enemy. It's actually the smile of heaven that I believe attracts the scowl of hell. And the same spirit that fell on Jesus in the water was well, the same spirit that led him to the wilderness because there was a divine purpose for it all. There's life in the desert to be found. So what do we see here? This first temptation, and many of you as Bible students, I know you've gone over this, a few kind of ways to think about it, but what I'm thinking about first, this first temptation had to do with identity, identity. Look at verse 3. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are, turn to your neighbor and say, if you are, if you are. Now, a little bit later, again, Satan will say, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God. Some of your translations might say, since you are, since you are. It's this idea of creating doubt. It's a mocking tone. It's almost like Satan was saying, who do you think you are? You know, who do you think you are? You think you're the son of God? Well, let's see what's happening on. I think this is a temptation of identity for Jesus. I really do. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Is that not a question we ask ourselves all the time? Is that not a temptation that we come across? Identity? Who, who am I? Who who do I think I am? It's a huge temptation for us to identify ourselves with ourselves academically, athletically, professionally. But this is not where our true identity comes from. This is why I spent some time thinking about the sequence, water to the wilderness, water to the wilderness. Because I believe the baptism of Jesus was a big deal. It was a big deal because of who showed up, right? Who showed up in the baptism of Jesus? The Holy Spirit falls down like a dove. The Heavenly Father cries out with his voice, and then Jesus is in the water. So when the Trinity is in the house, like something's going down, okay? You got all three of them in the place. Who shows up? It was a big deal. Secondly, what was said at the baptism of Jesus? I mean, when I started thinking about this, it just blew my mind. Look at what God the Father says to his Son in verse uh, 17 of Matthew 3. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So there's three things going on. First, this is my beloved, this is my son, and I am well pleased with him. 
Now, listen, this is before Jesus did anything. Like, all he had been was a carpenter. Like, I know he's Jesus. I'm not trying to be, you know, I, Jesus is Jesus. But he's still, at this point, he hadn't done any miracles. There's no teaching. He made a, maybe a coffee table, some mid-modern century chairs or something, you know. But like, but, like, he hadn't done anything. And God the Father is saying, this is my son. Huh. He is loved by me. And in him, I, I am well pleased with him. I started thinking about, you know, as a parent, is this not what every child longs to hear? You are loved. You are my child. And I am well pleased with you. I mean, wouldn't you want to hear that from your parents? You're my child. And you are loved. And I am well pleased with you. In fact, just this morning, just to kind of shake us up, turn to your neighbor and say that. Say, hey, I am loved. I am a child of God. And he is pleased with me. Now, just because I didn't work too much, go turn to your other neighbor. Say it again. I am loved. I am a child of God. And he is pleased with me. Next time you're at Starbucks, they say, hey, who, whose order is this? I'll tell you whose order it is. I am loved. I am a child of God. And he is pleased with me. Let that be the filter where you see everything. That's your identity, saints. You, are, you know who you are because you know whose you are. You are loved. You're a child of God, and he is pleased with you. Now, we recognize if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, then that is not true of you. You've got to give your life to Jesus. You've got to surrender your life to him in order for that to be true of you. And we recognize that the pleasure of God is not based upon our performance, but what Christ has done for us. That's what Easter is all about, him rising from the grave, dying our death so we can live his life. But if you're a saint here today, Oh, I pray that identity just fills you up, that you are loved. You are a child of God, and he is pleased with you. I think Jesus, at the baptism, he had that identity. Yeah, that's right. My heavenly Father loves me, and I am his son, and he is pleased with me. So when Satan says, who do you think you are? I know who I am. I know who I am, and I know whose I am. Don't, let ever, don't, let, don't ever let someone or something try to define who you are. You are loved. You're a child of God, and he is pleased with you. Amen? Amen. Second temptation deals with humanity. If the first one was identity, who do you think you are? Secondly, I think deals with humanity. Humanity. Satan knows our weaknesses. The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And we've got to remember that Jesus was 100% human. 100% human. Look what it says in verse 2 um, of Matthew 4. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Like, people don't go hungry in the South, though, too much because you're eating all the time. I enjoy it. I've had so much barbecue and macaroni and cheese, and it's been incredible. I had a soft serve. I had, what did I have yesterday? Some kind of, oh, Chick-fil-A ice cream. I mean, it, whew, I'm, I'm, I'm looking good. I'm not going to make it back on the airplane. But it says that Jesus was hungry. He had, he had humanity. He understands what we go through. He was hungry. And at the time, verse 3, we see, so the tempter said, hey, if you are the son of God, I'm going to want you to com command these stones to become loaves of bread, because everybody loves bread. Bread's the best. Carbohydrate load all day long. Bread's given out for free at restaurants. I mean, my, my wife's making sourdough bread all the time. It's like amazing. Little Kerrygold butter. It's the best. Jesus is tempted with his humanity. And the question here is, the question is, will he trust God to provide? Will he trust God to provide? Because, you know, you can meet your own needs in your own strength. And Jesus could have easily turned those stones to bread. But if he would have given in here right at this moment, he would have been saying, uh, you know, Heavenly Father, I don't need you. You know, I don't need you. I can provide for myself. I can take it from here. This temptation, the second temptation, the temptation of humanity Will you trust God to provide for you? Secondly, will you trust in God's purpose for you? Will you trust God to provide? And will you trust in God's purpose? Because verse 5, this other part of this temptation, the devil then takes him up to a holy city, sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and says to him, listen, if you're the son of God, just throw yourself down. It's written that he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so you don't put your foot against the stone. 
So Satan was tempting him to bypass the cross. Like, just bypass the pain, jump off this building, and everyone will see this miracle, and you can just, you know, create your own pathway to success, right? Like, like bypass God's plan and purpose for you, do it this way, and, and it'll be just fine. Satan always, I believe Satan always wants us to question the purposes of God. In fact, we don't know why things happen. We don't know why a year ago this pandemic occurred. And the temptation is for us to take things into our own hands and to work out our own solutions because you know what? We're very capable of that. Like a steam locomotive engine, you put the coal in, and that engine can last for a long time on that residue of coal. It can go down the tracks for a long time in its own steam engine, but it takes energy to put coal back in, back in, right? So the idea is we can do a lot of stuff on our own, but it's not by flesh, but by my spirit, says the Lord, right? So I think Satan's being challenged, Jesus is being challenged to doubt God's um, purpose here, to work out his own solution, to take things into his own hands. If we think about our life, and we sometimes, maybe I like to think about our lives as, as, as chapters being written, a story being written on our life. And a lot of times, the best title chapters are created later. What I mean by this is, you know, you might look at last year, 2020, and there might be some chapters in your life of last year that you would title that chapter, Disappointment, right? Failed Expectations, Shattered Dreams. But looking back where you stand today, maybe you would retitle that chapter, right? I thought it was disappointment. But looking back, I see that was actually my destiny. Now that, 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 at the time, I thought that was heartache from loss. But now I see actually that chapter should be written, Increased Intimacy with Jesus. A lot of times our chapters are written with the names of the chapters. We, we, we change the title later on. We can't doubt God's purpose. He has a plan. He has something that he's trying to accomplish. And I think Jesus here, Satan is tempting him, hey, just bypass the cross. Bypass that plan. Try my way. Try my way. And you'll get there faster. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Right? No, no, no. I'm not going to doubt God's provision. I'm not going to question God's purpose. I'm going I'm to trust. I'm going to obey. Quick temptation of identity, temptation of humanity. Thirdly, temptation of loyalty, of loyalty. Look at verse 8. So again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you just fall down and worship me. So look at the text there. All these things, all these kingdoms, all their glory, I'll give everything to you. All you have to do is fall down and worship. It's like Satan is saying, let's be realistic here, Jesus. You want to succeed? Then you got to get with the program, right? Come on my side. Like, cut some corners. Uh, just tell a little bit of a lie. Just bypass that avenue. Uh, just one small thing. No one will notice. No one will recognize it. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Just fall down and worship me. Where does your loyalty lie, Jesus? And isn't that the summation of them all, really, if you think about all the temptations? It's a, a, an idea of loyalty. Who, who are we going to trust? Who will we surrender our life to? Will we surrender our life? Will me be on the throne of my life? Will I be in control? Will I be driving or am I going to surrender and say, no, 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 Jesus, you, 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 like the song, you take the wheel. You're on the throne of my life. I surrender to you. My loyalty lies with you. Temptation of identity, who you are and whose you are. Temptation of humanity, will you take things into your own hands? Temptation of loyalty, or will you release and allow God to be sovereign over your life? trust God's provision, to trust God's purpose. Well, as we close, what's the solution? What's the solution to temptation? How do we turn temptation into triumph? These things we wrestle with, identity, humanity, and loyalty. How do we overcome? Solution number one, and God's word is our weapon. 
God's word is our weapon. What was the response of Jesus every single time he was tempted? You might know it. Verse 4, but he answered, it is written. Verse 7, and again he said, it is written. Come on, look to your neighbor, say, uh, Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written. It is written, right? The word of God is our weapon. You can always find a passage that will allow you to bear upon your current problem. Notice, in the water, the word came over Jesus. But in the wilderness, the word came out of Jesus because the word he had hidden into his heart. A little Bible verse for you right in the margin of your Bible, Psalm 119 and verse 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How do we tackle temptation? With truth. God's word is our weapon. Now, just the other day, I was having a conversation with a camel. Yes, that's right, with a camel. I said, camel, how are you able to survive in the wilderness? How are you able to go such long distances in, in the absence of water and vegetation? You know what the camel said to me? He said, listen, here's all I got to do. When I sit down to eat, I can consume large quantities of water, large quantities of vegetation, and I store them in my hump. So when I'm going through the wilderness, and when there's no water and there's no food, I can reach back to what was stored, and I can be content with that. Oh, is there a lesson from the camel we can learn? Are you abiding? I love this church coastline. You guys are abiding in God's word daily. Been at the Spencer's house. They've been playing those two-minute videos by the pastors. It's incredible. As a church, they're trying to have us abide in God's word. Go to God's word daily. Have it hidden into our heart so that when you're going through the wilderness, when there is a temptation, you can reach back at what's stored in your heart and say, oh, whoa, I got a word for that. Because God's word is our weapon. Amen? Are you feeding on God's word? Are you storing it in your heart? Here we are three months into the brand new year. Maybe many of you, I happen to love the uh, YouVersion Bible app on my phone. I love it. And I would encourage you, get into a Bible reading program. We're three months in. doesn't matter. Start now. Get God's word into your heart. Let it store so when you are tempted, when you're in the wilderness, you can reach back and feed on God's word. Because to triumph over temptation, we're going to need God's truth. Secondly, look for the hook. Look for the hook. Jesus has a plan for your life, but so does Satan. Satan wants to steal your future, kill your hope, and destroy your life. So don't look at a thing for what it is, but for where it's headed. Because sin never ends where it begins. It always takes you further in. It always does. Promises life only delivers death. Starts with excitement, ends with pain, hurt, and loss. Church, you, you know this. Another couple of verses to have in the margin of your Bible, Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs 20 and verse 17. Bread gained by deceit, it is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth is filled with gravel. So look for the hook. Be aware. This temptation all right, that worm looks tasty. Oh, but it's wrapped around a hook. Look for the hook. Thirdly, how do we turn temptation into triumph? We first understand God's word is our weapon. Secondly, we're going to be looking for the hook. Third, we're going to resist and remember. Resist and remember. Verse 10 of Matthew 4, how it ends. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Be gone. Like, get out of my face is what Jesus is saying. He's resisting. He's rejecting. He's refusing. I love this. And a predecision is a decision. I talked to so many. I got to do youth ministry for like eight years, and I always said, listen, if you're, if you're out past 10, you're in sin, Okay. Because when, you're, when it gets, you know, like at the time, like you're with your girlfriend and you find yourself like on a couch and it's dark watching Netflix, like it's too late, all right? Too late for that. You need to have some pre-decision, you know, like resist before that opportunity. Make some decisions before you get to that position. Make up your mind now. Jesus says, be gone, resist, refuse, reject. And then remember, remember. Look what Jesus says. You shall worship the Lord. And him only shall you serve. Like, I think Jesus is just reminding himself, wow, God is so good to me. 
He's so gracious. We recognize the goodness of the Lord. Rejoice in the grace of the Lord. And when we remember and we rejoice, it becomes a powerful force to resist temptation. When you remember, wow, God, what have you done? Look what you've done for me. Oh, wow, you are so gracious. You're so loving. You have steadfast love for me. Wow, you decided to descend. You left heaven, came to earth so I could leave earth and go to heaven. You died my death so I could live your life. Wow, okay, I'm resisting and I'm remembering your goodness and your grace. Oh, I'm going to worship the Lord. And I think that becomes an incredible, incredible fuel for us to turn temptation into triumph. We understand the cross paid the penalty for our sin, and the resurrection enables us to resist the power of sin. Be filled with the Spirit. Find your identity in Christ, and just keep fighting. Just keep fighting. Lessons we can learn in the wilderness. I'm not sure what you're going through in your life this morning, but I do believe the question of identity haunts us all. And not to belabor the point, but I, I, I just do believe there's some here this morning that you need to hear, you need to receive, that you are loved. And you are a child of God. And he is pleased with you. And that pleasure that he bestows upon you is not based upon performance, what you can do for him, but what he did for you. We love him because he first loved us. So I believe there's some of you here that you just, you just need to receive that this morning. Receive it afresh. You're loved. You're a child of God. And God is so pleased with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Love to give you the opportunity today as we're worshiping in a, in a moment, as we're closing. Come see myself or any of the pastors here. They'd love to introduce you to Jesus, the lover of your soul. It would be our joy and pleasure. But our identity, oh, friends, temptation is to, to, to be defined by who we, what we do and our performance. Don't let that happen. Temptation of humanity to take things into our own hands, make our own plans, our own way. No, no, no. We need to live open-handedly. Lord, this is, my life is, is yours. I'm letting go. I'm letting go. Temptation of loyalty, and I'm surrendering my life to you. Friends, when we do that, there is abundant life for us to live. And we can turn temptation into triumph. Amen.